Now, let me go back to sort of the general large message that I've been talking about. At the end of the Dover trial, many people suggested that the verdict that came out in our favor was a victory of science over faith. Sorry, I forgot the why there. Um, and a lot of people, uh, I saw newspaper articles arguing that it's God versus science in a Pennsylvania courtroom and that sort of stuff. A lot of us involved in our side of the case were surprised at this. Of the 11 plaintiffs involved in the case, seven of them are professing Christians, three of them are Sunday school teachers, and one of them runs a summer Bible camp. And the notion that these plaintiffs were somehow anti-religious simply flew in the face of reality. Nonetheless, this was a common impression. Why is that? Part of the intentional strategy of the anti-evolution movement, what Philip Johnson from Berkeley called the wedge strategy, is to portray evolution as being anti-God. And Johnson said, the objective of the intelligent design strategy is to convince people that Darwinism is inherently atheistic. That'll shift the debate from creation versus evolution to the existence of God versus the non-existence of God. Then we can introduce people to the truth of the Bible, the question of sin, and finally introduce them to Jesus. Any person who tells you that intelligent design is not religiously motivated, once again, remind them of what the founder of the movement, Philip Johnson, said his intention was. Clearly religious. If you were to Google creation versus evolution into the web and look for images, you come up with websites with little graphics like this that kind of like weigh creation and evolution against each other as though it's one or the other. Um, my co-author, Joe Levine, knows I use this slide. And a couple of months ago, he called me up and said, Ken, you know that scale? Yeah, I said, yeah, I know the slide. He says, you'll never guess the photo I saw on the website of a Christian school in the upper Midwest. And this was the photo he saw. And there's a biology teacher there. And that's our textbook. And look what he's weighing it against. Um, although I do, when I looked at that, I did take a certain amount of satisfaction from the fact that apparently it takes two Bibles to outweigh one of our... <laughs> one of our textbooks. But I, I want to make a point here. And the point is you see this image of conflict between biology and religion. And that's really what you see in this photograph. And I want to give you an example of what I mean by that. Lots of you, I'm sure, have seen this symbol, the ichthys, the Christian symbol of redemption on lapel pins, bumper stickers, stuff like that. Well, a few years ago, some evolutionary biologists knew about that and said, let's have a little fun. Um, and let's turn that image around. We'll make the Darwin fish that has little incipient tiktaalik style evolving legs. Well, Christians have a sense of humor too. They say, oh, really? Um, we know what we're going to do with that, which is you have the <laughs> truth fish eating the Darwin fish. And if I had to put one of these on the bumper of my truck, it would be the Darwin fish kissing the Jesus fish or something like that. Thank you so much for doing the show. This is Happy a thrill for me. It's a thrill for me. Let me ask you something. Walk me through, I want to give you a shot here, <laughs> explain evolution from the primordial soup to how I got here today in my limo. Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> Walk me through it. Take uh, 30 seconds. Okay. How about if we crawl? Basically, what evolution tells us is that we are united. We're put together in a fabric of life with every other living thing on this planet. Uh -huh. um, up until about, oh, two, three hundred years ago, people thought that life on Earth had never changed. But they immediately became aware at the end of the 17th and 18th century that life had changed. And the process of change explaining that has been one of biology's biggest projects for the last 150 years. And that explanation is evolution. But, uh, well, so speaking of designers, uh, you're a Catholic. Yes, sir. I am a Catholic also. Have you forgot the creed? Jesus, through him, all things were made. For us men and for our salvation. I remember exactly. all this very well. Okay. But there's so also, don't you see a conflict there? you got to choose. No, there's not a conflict. There's not a conflict. There isn't? And you don't have to choose. And here's the problem. The biggest thing that the opponents of evolution have going for them is a fiction. It's not true. And that is the idea that evolution and religion have to be in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. What it amounts to, in a sense, is that I have a higher opinion of God than the people who favor intelligent design. Because they think he's sort of a little pedestrian god who has a lot of cheap tricks. He had to design this. Whoops, it went extinct. He designed that. It went extinct. The fossil museums of the world are filled with his mistakes. My view is that I've got a higher opinion. This is a guy who was so clever that he set a process in motion that gave rise to everything on this planet, and you and me, and maybe even Bill O'Reilly. You know what? <laughs> Thank you.
I, I agree with you about O'Reilly. <laughs> All right? I think O'Reilly could be so involved that he's one of the X-Men. Okay, now, let, me, let me ask you something. You think God is that clever. I think God is so clever that he just made it look like there's a fossil record. So, so you, isn't God powerful enough that he just sort of put all those dino bones down in there to give us the illusion we've been here for a while? Well, in so, fact, nothing existed before I was born. So, so your, your theory is essentially what I would call the Steve Martin theory of evolution, mm -hmm. which is that God put all these things down here just to show us he's a wild and crazy God. Well, I don't reject that for scientific reasons. I reject it for theological ones, which is that I don't choose to believe in a deceptive creator. Um, Mr. Miller. Will you come back? We've got to go now, but will you please come back on another show and explain to me this whole sun doesn't go around the earth thing? We'll work on it. Okay. Ken Miller, thank you so much. Um, th thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did being on that show. Although, especially if you're involved in university administration, I do have some very sad news for you. Um, and that is nothing I have ever done in my entire professional career has ever gained for me the respect with my students of being on the Colbert Report. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not sure that says anything positive about higher education. But I, I do want to point out, you heard a little bit of theology in, in those answers that I gave. I do want to point out that the views I articulate there are actually pretty widely held. Uh, it was a, a letter to the journal Nature about two years ago that pointed this out. Um, many of us in biology know this very famous quote from one of the great evolutionary biologists of the 20th century, Theodosius Dobzhansky. And Dobzhansky wrote in an article in 1973, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It's absolutely true. But it, the letter writer pointed out in the very same article, Dobzhansky went on. He said, you know, it's wrong to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive alternatives. I, Dobzhansky, am a creationist and an evolutionist. Why? Because evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. And Dobzhansky said the creator made the living world not by caprice, supernatural fiat, I would say not by intelligent design, but by evolution propelled by natural selection. And again, it's a more common view than one might think. Um, summer before last, one of the most famous molecular biologists in the world, Francis Collins, the director of the Human Genome Project, wrote an extraordinary book called The Language of God. Um, Francis is an uncompromising evolutionist. You work on the human genome, you have to be, because the evidence is every there, everywhere there, but he's also a deeply committed evangelical Christian. And anyone who thinks that these two points of view are not compatible, you ought to read Collins' book, and I think it will open your eyes in that particular respect. Um, who really put this, and I think the very best perspective, um, right after the Dover trial, was a columnist for the Washington Post. And the columnist was Charles Krauthammer. Now, if you don't know him, Krauthammer is probably the most conservative columnist writing for the Washington Post. And when George Will writes for the same newspaper, that's, that's, that's saying something. But look at what he wrote after the Dover trial. Phony theory, false conflict. Intelligent design foolishly pits evolution against faith. And I love the way that Krauthammer pit this. He said, how ridiculous to make evolution the enemy of God. What could be more elegant, more simple, more brilliant, more economical, more creative, indeed more divine, than a planet with millions of life forms, distinct and yet interactive, all ultimately derived from accumulated variations in a single, double-stranded molecule, pliable and fecund enough, to give us mollusks and mice, Newton and Einstein, even if it also gave us the Kansas Board of Education. <laughs> <laughs>